Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the final um, event of the Donia Human Rights Center's uh, lecture and panel series for the academic year. I'm Steve Ratner. I'm a professor at the law school and I'm the director of the Donia Center. Uh, just want to welcome you all. Um, thank you all for coming out, uh, coming inside on such a beautiful day, for, but for such a, a great uh, intellectual piece that we'll have today. Um, I just wanted to um, express my thanks to uh, to uh, really the organizer of this entire event, which is uh, Professor Matthew Fletcher. Um, Matthew put this all together and we'll be introducing our, our three speakers, uh, Diego, Kristen, and Alexe. And I just want to thank you for doing all the hard work to make this together. And also Daniel Schmidt from the uh, International Institute who helped uh, plan with all the logistics. Uh, thank you so much for, for your hard work. Um, the Donia Center is the university's uh, intellectual center for the study of human rights. We sponsor summer internships for undergraduates and uh, research fellowships for graduate students. We fund uh, faculty research. Um, we have the monthly speaker series, including the MLK event, and we organize the Donia Human Rights Fellows Program for undergraduates and picks who are interested in study of human rights. So we have a lot going on, a lot more planned. But uh, without any further ado, let me pass the baton to, uh, to Matthew to uh, introduce the event and our speakers. Thank you again. Thank you, Stephen. Well, I appreciate you all coming. Um, so what we're going to do today, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Matthew Fletcher. I teach at the law school. I have an also an appointment at the Department of American Culture and Native Studies. I'm a citizen of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. And uh, I will be your moderator today. So today you'll have um, two formal speakers and then a uh, commentator, hopefully, who will join us by Zoom in a little bit. Uh, so our speakers are, I'm, I will get out my little sheet just to make sure I get their bios. Our speakers are Diego Tituanya, uh, Quechua Otahu from Ecuador. Uh, Diego is a diplomat from the Ecuadorian Foreign Service. He has multilateral experience in human rights, disarmament, and migration issues. Diego is currently serving as Deputy Chief of Mission for the Ecuadorian Embassy in Santo Domingo of the Dominican Republic. Alexei Sekarev is a member of the Karelian people of the border region of Finland and Russia. He's a linguist, a language, a language activist, and recently was the chair of the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and is the vice chair of the United, United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples. Um, later on, we'll be joined hopefully by Kristen Carpenter, who is a law professor at the University of Colorado Law School. And uh, she was formally, the, uh, formally appointed to the United Nations Expert Mechanism and served as a member for North America from 2017 to 2021. She's also a tribal judge. She serves as a justice on the Shawnee Tribes Supreme Court and also is the co-leader of the Implementation Project, which is a project uh, between the University of Colorado Law School and the Native American Rights Fund um, to help implement the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So what we're gonna do today is we're going to, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions uh, of our panelists. Uh, we'll just kind of go for two or three rounds in that regard. And Kristen hopefully will join us, offer some additional commentary. And then if there's any time, uh, we'll do a little bit of Q&A from, from the core group, from the people here. So does that sound good? All right. So uh, we'll get started. Uh, I'll start, I'll, I'll give a little bit of an introduction, a little bit of background of, for myself. Um, I'm Michigan Indian, so American Indian. Um, we're Anishinaabe, we speak the... My ancestors spoke Anishinaabegawin, which is a language that luckily is taught uh, in the, at this university. And there's actually some Anishinaabegawin right here. A uh, gentleman here, I have to point him out, is wearing a shirt that says basically go blue and Anishinaabegawin. So we have that. Um, my whole family has shirts that are very similar to what you have. So it's really cool to see you here today. Um, as, you, as many of you probably know, um, indigenous languages in the United States are very, um, very much under attack and uh, indigenous language speakers, fluent speakers are becoming more and more rare. Uh, my own relatives stopped speaking the language in the 1930s, 1940s, largely because they were sent off to boarding schools such as Mount Pleasant Industrial Education Board or Industrial Boarding School in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Um, also some of my relatives went to uh, were farmed out effectively to uh, through the Indian relocation program of the 1940s and 1950s 
Um, many of my relatives were sent to by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to Detroit, Grand Rapids, Milwaukee, Chicago, even as far as Minneapolis and San Francisco in some, con- in some instances, where they were sort of separated from the community um, and lost their language that way. I would also add that speaking an indigenous language in the United States is not particularly popular and largely disfavored, is not taught in public schools for the most part until very recently on some Indian reservations. Um, And certainly people who spoke it suffered, frankly, discrimination against them by virtue of their fact that they were different. And so um, it's pretty rare in the United States to meet indigenous speakers, but one of the great things that I get to see as a person traveling around the United States to lots of different tribal communities um, and also big meetings with a lot of tribal people like, for example, recently the uh, University of Michigan uh, Native American Student Association powwow here in Ann Arbor over at Scotland High School. Um, and anytime you walk in a room like that with a bunch of Native people, you will inevitably see children between the ages of 1 and 10 or 15 now who are conversing casually in the language in a way that as a kid when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, we never saw anything like that. We knew little or nothing about our own culture, little or not. So... It's an amazing turnaround just in the last half century. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it up with Diego first and ask you both, Diego and then Alexi, to describe your background as members of indigenous communities from where you're from and how you started to work on indigenous languages. Thank you, thank you, Matthew. Well, uh, first, of all, first of all, I would like to congratulate the organizers and for having made possible to have this meeting and bringing together uh, all of us. And I'm really glad that I have uh, next to me Alexei, who is one of the experts uh, in the entry and in the permanent forum, who are pushing a lot uh, to have uh, to proclaim the International Year of Indigenous Language and then the International Day. Um, for me, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, well, I would like to introduce a little bit of myself. Uh, I am Diego Tizuani. I am member of the Quichua Tabalo Nation from Ecuador. Um, what I can say is that um, in my community, uh, we usually refer to us with a concept of uh, Mindalais which is an Asian uh, indigenous people who were focused on the art of trade and commerce. And due to that uh, aspect, uh, anti-imagination, because the current generation, fortunately, they are studying, but anti-imagination generation, we didn't have that opportunity to study the university. Most of us, even we didn't finish the high school. So what we usually do is to travel around the world uh, and to sell handicrafts around the world. Uh, I was selling uh, much that I had the opportunity actually to come to an arbor many years ago, <laughs> like 12 or 11 years ago. Uh, I came to sell handicrafts around the, the city. They are one fair famous fair here in Ann Arbor. I don't know the matter. It's in August. August, probably. I don't know the, the, the day, but there is one big fair around the city. So I used to say handicraft. But what I am telling you is why, why is important this background of uh, being a, a businessman somehow selling handicrafts? Because my work uh, focus on indigenous languages actually started with, with that experience. Uh, in Ecuador, in South America, uh, we didn't have um, this experience, unfortunate experience of organs, but uh, we also suffer racism and discrimination. Um, we moved somehow from the rural areas to the urban areas. And most of us that we grow up in the uh, urban areas, uh, we didn't learn our own language. Somehow we were disconnected from our community. 
And we didn't realize that our language was important. When I realized that my language was important, when I came to US, when I years old, years old probably, and then as a migrant, we usually share an apartment with people and other indigenous people from my community, and all of them they were communicating Kichu. And I was the only one that I couldn't understand. So I didn't understand what they were talking, what they were joking, and not. And I realized before that. And immediately after I went back to my country and I said to my parents, why did you didn't teach me? I really did it. Because it was not just of the part of the how uh, in this, the Kichwa Tabalo people were interacting in New York. But when we usually uh, we were selling handicrafts, we normally, they you normally talk in Kichwa in the way that the other one cannot understand. You know, because most of you, or some of you understand Spanish, you know, what they don't speak, but not Kichwa. So if they want to uh, say something, they speak in Kichwa, but I didn't know Kichwa. So I realized the importance of, of, of my language, and I asked my parents why they did it. And the reason is uh, kind of... Uh, similar of the experience, racist discrimination. It was a structural discrimination that it was actually internalized by the indigenous peoples, referring to our own language as a Yankashi, which means that is a language that doesn't have value. So when they want to refer to our language, they refer as a Yankashi. And if you understand the meaning of that, is that you are referring you to your own they like when they were speaking in, in Spanish, they say, no, no, let's speak in Yangashin. But they internalize that our language doesn't have value. But this is part of the structural discrimination. And you know, with the time you realize we don't have to refer that to our own language. Our language has value. But um they my parents, for example, they didn't believe that uh, uh, some in the future I would need my own language. Uh, they didn't teach us. We grow up in a urban area, so why is important? And actually, my mother told me that, for example, uh, that my have, my grandfather uh, didn't teach her Kitra because. Uh, he doesn't want that, that her suffer as he suffered. Because, you know, when you speak Kichwa, it's difficult to speak uh, Spanish. You change the word. So he feel discrimination. He feel racism. So he doesn't want that my mom and my aunts suffer the same. So this is part of how I started my world, actually. Uh, and I try to understand why this happened. And with the time, uh, I have the opportunity to connect and actually to work, to uh, have some actions, international actions for indigenous language. Uh, during my posting in New York as a diplomat, I had this opportunity and the other to be the facilitator of the resolution of the rights of indigenous people. That resolution is really important because through that resolution, we proclaim international year and we proclaim international decade of indigenous uh, That is a little bit of my background. Uh, we we'll continue talking about that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Antonia, for the Central University of the presentation. Matthew, uh, personally, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I think it's very important that the university communities around the world 
participate in the global language movement uh, because the, there are things that universities are uh, good at in terms of language documentation, language revitalization, terminology, many other things that are very important, actually crucial for, for the current work uh, of safeguarding of the linguistic diversity of the world. Uh, so my community is Karelian people, uh, that is indigenous people living in Northwest Russia. Uh, also, uh, the, there are Karelians in Finland and uh, near Russian capital city Moscow due to different historic uh, movements and situations. Uh, so these communities settle, uh, have settled uh, uh, far away from each other, but uh, they keep in contact and uh, um, exchange experiences and develop joint programs in order to help uh, relevant dialects and relevant languages to, to survive for this uh, globalization and uh, consequences of the generational trauma uh, that still uh, has its effects, even though there is no uh, any more uh, suppression that it used to be. Uh, there's still this inertia that uh, is rooted uh, in, in the linguistic communities. Um, so the typical questions that uh, my friend um, Diego just uh, explained how he asked his uh, uh, parents why they didn't teach him the language. So the same questions that you're doing as uh, Even though uh, I was raised in a, in a family uh, totally in a Russian speaking environment because my dad was most Australian. Uh, and my mom, who is Russian, didn't speak uh, the common language. I mean, the, 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 the common language they spoke was Russian. So that's why I was, uh, I was raised in this kind of environment. But also, uh, my dad never spoke Korean uh, because uh, his mom, my grandmother, who spoke uh, Korean, just Korean, but he went to school. Uh, at some point, decided that um, oh, maybe she was forced to, to decide so uh, not to teach, uh, not to speak Korean in the family. And that was the time. Uh, I mean, the whole history of, of, of the Soviet era of my country is, is very uh, controversial in terms of the linguistic policy. Sometime in, in the 20s, for example, the, the government wanted to. Uh, or established policies to uh, support different different languages, different peoples, uh, self determinations, and so on. Uh, but then, already in the thirties, uh, there was a vice versa movement uh, when, uh, uh, especially in my republic, which is the border the border republic uh, with Finland. So, because of the difficult relationship between Soviet Union and Finland, there was a decision to uh, to popularize Finnish language more than Karelian. Also, the Karelian language was perceived as uh, a, a non-developed and certain vocabulary was lacking. Uh, and when they started translating uh, different official documents into Karelian language, it was full of Russian uh, uh, words uh, borrowed from the Russian language and it looked uh, not very well uh, in the eyes of the decision makers that so decided to turn down all the uh, development and development policies at the time. Uh, and also, along with the establishment of the uh, so called uh, Finnish Karelian uh, Soviet Republic uh, in, in 1944 as a you know, to, to to keep, to keep the, the border relation with Finland difficult and to, uh, um, to say to uh, other response uh, to, to Finland that uh, didn't want to join the Soviet Union. So uh, in that republic, of course, Finnish language was uh, a better uh, meaning better meaning in terms of education, in terms of uh, theater, in terms of uh, public life. Um, and that uh, 
in, in, in from that and that time in the, in the schools when my grandmother uh, was there uh, so they they just said you just said that you should not speak uh, the language and not only in school that was certainly forgiven but also in families because they said uh, that language is out there it's not useful uh, and, and so on and so forth and that, that kind of reputation that was imposed on indigenous people uh, rooted, fortunately, in, in, in lots of families, lots of people. Uh, and they decided, even though they still silently, uh, quietly spoke among themselves, but they didn't uh, didn't speak it uh, to, to the kids, to the grandkids. Uh, and it changed, started to change only uh, in the late 80s and uh, early 90s when the uh, movement to um, revitalized languages started to evolve in many places of, of my country. Um, and as I said, so being raised in a uh, Russian speaking environment, I still knew that my grandmother was Australian. And uh, in, in the summer cabin, I spent a lot of time all summers with her. And so she, uh, from time to time, she used some words like home. Body. Uh, like uh, when I disturb her to, to do something, so she said, like, man, a boy, like, uh, go away. And I, I asked her what to say, and so she explained me all the different words. And when I, at that time, I already was uh, in school uh, learning Finnish, uh, Finnish language as a kindred language, a native language, Australian. So I, I understood uh, some of the words because they sounded similarly. Uh, and um, when I was in the university already, uh, I decided that, well, I should learn Karelian as well, not only Finnish, uh, even though in some places in, in, in northern, northern Karelia, so you can just use your Finnish in order to communicate with Karelians, but this is not the same. And uh, so I decided uh, to, to study uh, my own native language at that age. Uh, when I was already in my early 20s, basically. And um, I decided that uh, I, I have an opportunity to make a difference here, uh, not only on a personal level by learning the language, but also uh, contributing to the movement of my people, uh, which is the unlike uh, many other indigenous peoples in the world, uh, white people's uh, main main issue uh, around which the whole movement is built is the language. The language, the status of the language in the Republic of Karelia, and the uh, future uh, of, of the language. So we, at some point, uh, and I'm finishing this part, uh, at some point um, when there was a, a, a con the Congress, another con one of the Congresses of the Karelian people 10 years ago, uh, my one of the elders called to me, and I was in the drafting committee of the outcome document of the Iranian Congress. So, um, and in the draft, we had a lot of stuff about language. And we have to strive to the state status of the language because Karelia, the Republic of Karelia is the only republic in, in Russia with just Russian as only one state language, the official language. Uh, and we wanted Karelia to be second official language. And so this elder called me and said, don't you think that the train has gone so we don't have time to do this? And we don't have opportunities, resources, basically. Nobody will speak. Uh, I said, well, I think, uh, and I'm younger, of course, but I, I think that um, till the last speaker of the Korean language is alive, we have to fight this. Uh, and we and I myself uh, cannot sign a paper which will say uh, we abandon our language, we abandon the status. Uh, because when you do that, so the youngers, the, the, the youngsters, the, the kids, they will look at us and say, well, uh, you did it yourself. So you abandoned your language. You didn't want to fight. Why would we? Uh, and um, so we're still in this fight. 
and uh, trying to uh, uh, not to, as some people say, to continue uh, agony, but we want to uh, actually make a difference. So the language will uh, will be alive. Thank you both. Um, so I'm glad Diego brought it up already, but let's talk about the International Decade of Indigenous Languages and you know opportunities, complications, anything you say? Challenges. <laughs> Challenges, yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. Well, I, I, as I mentioned in the, the first part, uh, yeah, and I'm really glad that um, we have this uh, good coincidence when I arrived there because you know, the, the critical situation of indigenous language has been raised by the indigenous people for many years. Uh, the International Year was proclaimed for in 2019, but since the beginning of the establishment of the permanent forum, the, the indigenous in 2003, the indigenous peoples draw the attention of the critical of languages. But uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of how normally works these uh, uh, resolutions at the UN level, you know, uh, the general resolution are not legally binding. Uh, uh, when the permanent forum was established, it was established under the, uh, another uh, principal organ of the UN as an uh, advisory body which means that the recommendation are recommendations, so even less value than the general assembly solutions. So they were, they were effort uh, from, from many years ago. Um, but, you know, I, I think it was a good coincidence that I arrived, uh, I was uh, appointed in 2014 uh, to the permanent mission of Ecuador. Uh, to the UN in New York. And uh, when I arrived, they were having, uh, they were negotiating an outcome document for the World Conference of the United States. So one of the main things that uh, from my capital, from Ecuador, it was to find some ways to promote, uh, to include in this document the importance of the language. But when this the introduction came, it was too late. You know, there were many other uh, things that were difficult to achieve, and we didn't have enough time to uh, include one more. So it was not possible in 2014, but um, the Permanent Forum uh, Secretariat understood that uh, we need to push again. Why push again? Because it was uh, 2008. It was one uh, initiative was promoted uh, through the Human Rights Council regarding it. Okay. it was, they also made something, but at the end, they couldn't achieve uh, Something else like that we did in 2016, but uh, they reconvene again. So they um, organized a, a expert workshop in 2016, January 2016, and uh, on focus on indigenous languages. Uh, sorry to <laughs> going back, but I just want to give you the core picture of the international decade because. It's coming with international year. And um, I believe it's really valuable that you can understand how difficult can be this kind of things to achieve at the UN and um, how uh, it's important to know all these costs. So um, that happened in 2016, January. The uh, East Expert uh, Workshop uh, was uh, organized and they came with two specific recommendations. To proclaim the International Year of Indigenous Languages, they wanted to have in 2018. And also, 
they uh, recommend to have an international team. They didn't specify the years, but they wanted to have international team. Later on, the permanent forum uh, reconvened, and they took the recommendation coming from this uh, expert watch. And they say, okay, yes, we also recommend to have this international year in 2020, they say. So they were two, two years. <laughs> One, the workshop, they wanted to have 2018. The permanent forum wanted to have it in 2020. <laughs> we proclaim it for 2018, <laughs> a middle ground. Uh, for that. But uh, it was possible because um, in that moment, you know, it's like um, we have more support. The, the international uh, movement from indigenous uh, peoples were pushing for that. Uh, members uh, from the Emory, they wanted to have the international year. Members of the permanent forum, they wanted to have the international year. And we were some countries that also wanted to. So it was a difficult negotiation at the end. But it was possible. And finally, uh, in December of 2016, uh, the General Assembly decides to proclaim the International Year of Indigenous Women in 2018. I'm going into this specific part because I believe that is an opportunity in that moment that we see that it was to call international attention. Uh, most of you, for sure, they, they, you will know that at the UNESCO level, they also disappeared a program that they were having on. So they were not actually uh, having to promote, uh, to try to rescue, to revitalize. We don't have any. So what's really important to call the international attention for this matter, that I mentioned, uh, started many, many years ago, uh, was one of the main demands for the digital people to draw that attention. So I believe that is an opportunity that we saw in that moment. And uh, that main objective is part of the international uh, to call the attention of an international uh, level, also a national level, but it was like to have this uh, big umbrella that can um, include many actions coming from different actors, academia, governments, indigenous peoples, everyone, you know, connected under this uh, umbrella. Of the, at the beginning of the international year, but one year, it was not going to be enough to, to resolve. So we say, no, we, some of them, they just wanted to have the, the international year and that's all. But we explained it. We cannot have just one year. This is, we are losing and losing our language. So at least we need 10 years to see what we can do and to try to measure the, the actions and to see if we are having the impact on that in our actions. So we push for that. And then at the end of 2019, uh, during the celebration of the international year, it was possible to talk in international thing. That was the opportunity. Challenge, if I may, just one challenge, you ready, uh, which is um, how can this um, uh, action that we, that was possible to achieve at international level can uh, be implemented in the territories, can be applied in the That is the main challenge that I realize that is happening. So, so somehow it was difficult. We did it, but with, uh, I mean, from my view, I don't see that in the field are connected with international level. So that is the main challenge. And how can we give the no resources for the actions that many people, many relevant actors are doing in the field to revitalize 
Yes, I think um, uh, we'll get on seven is, is, is all right. And um, that's the, the history of the proclamation. Uh, and I remember, I mean, I actually, today I looked um, some information with the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues uh, recommendation database, uh, just with the languages. There, and the forum was established uh, almost 20 or yes, 20 years ago. Uh, of course, it has hundreds of different recommendations, actually, 80 mention of languages uh, in the database. And uh, I looked, uh, for example, one recommendation from 2008, and, and that said, uh, so we call, we call on states to recognize uh, the different methodologies to revitalize indigenous languages, uh, including language nests. And, uh, and already in 2022, uh, I mean, now it's 2022, so we can say that, uh, you know, at least there is no need anymore to explain to any state uh, in the world uh, that revitalization of indigenous languages is important. The, the, the National Year of Indigenous Languages and the start of the decade have already made, made a difference because uh, at this point, there's a global consensus uh, around the fact that uh, we are in a crisis of linguistic diversity, uh, around the fact that indigenous languages are a value for the humanity. That these are not only the means of communication, but also the human right. Uh, indigenous languages contain a lot of knowledge uh, that indigenous people have. Knowledge that we need uh, for the climate change process, for the biodiversity safeguard, and so many, many issues. And uh, all this can, can go away if we don't support, if we don't say the languages and whatever it's contained there. Uh, and so there is a global consensus now. So everybody, uh, United Nations system, the, all the member states, and uh, so they agree. And actually, in my view, and Diego can, uh, can say if I'm wrong, uh, this is like nothing in the UN, nothing in the international community is very fast. But right? any this is like you mentioned, 2016, a group of people convenes and proposes to proclaim a, a, a year and a decade. And already the same year, actually, uh, the, the General Assembly in December 2016 already decided that 2019 uh, will be a, 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 an international, the International Year of Indigenous Languages. So very fast action. Uh, that's incredible. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that something can be done so quickly in the UN uh, after a uh, year of advocacy. And, uh, you know, the UN, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was negotiated for 20 years. Uh, and, you know, the, the Permanent Forum was negotiated for 20 years, everything else. So it's like a very, very fast uh, action on the languages, which means um, that there is a lot of support also for the idea that this language should, should be uh, revitalized. And actually see like in, in my country, for example, which um, before the, all these movements, it used to be difficult to um, do the language nest methodology, for example. Somehow there were some certain certain uh, bureaucrats in the federal government that, that thought uh, this is not good, even though it worked in Maori, uh, it worked in Finland, it worked elsewhere in Hawaii, uh, on, on the different name. Uh, but it, it is a, a methodology that works actually and produces. Uh, quite quickly new speakers uh, among children and so on. Um, so it's effective. Uh, but some, some bureaucrats said, well, it, it cannot be just taken from another place and put it here. Uh, this is a different community, different, uh, different country. So, and now after the year, and after the decade has started, so we don't need to convince anybody there, the federal government, so they understand the language nest is a good methodology. Finally, eventually they understand that 
And so we, need, we, we don't need to spend time on, on, on convincing them anymore. So, and we, uh, as Diego said, the, the national year uh, was basically not enough time. And then that time was used to uh, inform uh, and raise awareness about the critical loss of indigenous languages, while the decade is an opportunity to act, uh, to make a plan for each and every single language that needs that plan, a plan uh, and resources, resources that have to be uh, allocated, including financial resources. And Emory at some point said, I think in, in a study, uh, that at least the same amount of money have to be allocated for language revitalization as uh, had been spent for the language suppression over the decades and centuries. Uh, I don't know how to calculate that amount, but uh, it's probably a lot. Uh, and that's why when we say, and indigenous peoples don't like when their language is called, are called dying or whatever, uh, because it undermines their prestige. So they better say, sleeping languages or under-resourced languages. So we need, as they have said, we need uh, to bring resources to this work uh, as much as needed and actually um, uh, do, do the action, uh, use this opportunity to do the action and but join forces, not only governments, not only indigenous people, but also, as I said, in the beginning, the universities, the uh, academia and, and also the private sectors, they have money, they have technology sometimes. Uh, and in UNESCO last minute, so we saw some companies coming like Google, Facebook, others, uh, smaller companies also. I met uh, a company in uh, Paraguay uh, that was dealing with some, some kind of uh, apps, uh, you know, on uh, apps for those who like, I don't know, health, healthcare or healthcare issues. They wanted to use languages as well because they understood it could be used uh, for learning language, for example. It's fun. I mean, by joining forces, uh, we can do a lot uh, during the decade. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's talk about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So the, we, we call it UNDRIP around here usually. Um, it has, it, it creates uh, or acknowledges the right to your own language as a human right. And I'm gonna say right here in the United States that is, we don't have human rights here. <laughs> Maybe we do, but our governing documents tend to not respect human rights. Um, and so that's a little bit different for us. How, how is that? Um, I guess my question is how, uh, what are the challenges and opportunities for uh, acknowledging and recognizing working with uh, languages, indigenous languages as a human right? Um, well, uh, it's, I believe it's important to understand that the indigenous language is not just a method of communication. So uh, what the indigenous language, at least for the indigenous people, is, is the central part of our identity. In, in which way we can you know, uh, continue surviving. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of us, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I, I, my pledge, I, I promise myself that at the end of the decade, I have to speak each one, my own language very well. I push it for that, so at least from my side, I have to demonstrate that this was something that everyone had. But, uh, you know, with the language, we are losing also uh, our work, our vision. You know? So it's really important to understand that, that not just a method of communication, part of our language. So then it's connected with the, with our rights, you know. Um, and I would like to, to, to actually read what it states, the Article 13 of the Andrew, which said that indigenous people have the right to revitalize 
use, develop, and transmit to the future generations their languages, oral tradition, writings, and, and literatures. Uh, for the right to provide the state should take effective measures to protect this right, including through interpretation, political, legal, and administrative proceedings. So, well, the Andrew, yeah, we can enter here. Uh, to, we can question it, or some of some people can question it, the validity uh, of the Andrew because. Is part of the UN Declaration. Uh, but I see that more and more there are countries that are uh, uh, highlighting or uh, including uh, the ANDRI as, as a part of the internal uh, laws. So then it's, it's coming strong. Uh, we don't have a convention. Uh, of the right of the what we just have that in the declaration. But uh, at least it's an uh, um, uh, example, a reference, the big reference that we put in people we have when we are talking about the So as was mentioned by Yali say, uh, you know, the, the, the draw the declaration put more than Twenty years, so I believe the depend of us. How can we continue to push in that these rights that are included in the country can be recognized as other human rights? Um, they are countries that are already included in, in the constitution level. Um, it's a fight, the trouble that we need to uh, that uh, we are having at the moment, but uh, probably that is going to be uh, the opportunity that uh, we have. There is this document we need to listen and push it <laughs> that can be recognized as the example uh, of what we need to refer when we're talking about the rise of the Yes. Um, yeah, just to you add, um, you have a certain side of the uh, of the, you know, the declaration, uh, which is the main uh, languages in the document, uh, but also, um, uh, and, and that's why it was important uh, to. Uh, to convince UNESCO, for example, UNESCO as a lead agency uh, in the decade to use the human rights based approach uh, while drafting the global action plan uh, the year, the decade as well. Uh, and I'm glad that the, the global action plan has uh, this many references to uh, human rights. Human rights based approaches uh, for element the global action plan and um as a, as a permanent forum uh, so last year and the year before we already um, um called on states to um create national action plans local action plans in order to uh, promote the same human rights based approach uh not only considering languages part of culture cultural heritage but also as a human right. So the human rights based approach must be uh, a governing, uh, the leading principle of the decade at all levels, not only international level, uh, which is, of course, uh, for many states easy to go in New York and say, well, we, we support this whole uh, the declaration, everything, but back home, uh, sometimes very poor action uh, or no action, uh, no support. And um, actually, it's very interesting to see that uh, despite all the consensus around the decade, all the, the support, there is only a, a few states having national action plans at this point. And even among those three, I'm not sure human rights-based approach is uh, the governing principle there uh, in, in those action plans. And it, it's not only to recognize Article 13 as uh, you know, the, the right to transmit, to transmit and 
save safeguard uh, traditions, languages, and so on and so forth, but also understand the, in, the different interlinkages between uh, linguistic rights and all other rights uh, that are enshrined in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, because it's uh, an indivisible and a comprehensive document, so you cannot implement something there but, uh, without uh, taking action on other articles. Uh, and last session of the Permanent Forum, there was a, a lot of discussion about the interlinkages between languages and health, for example. Uh, there was a very, very strong message from the indigenous youth uh, saying that uh, the World uh, Health Organization, WHO, has to improve their policies and, and include indigenous languages as an indicator of human health, uh, and languages as an indicator of human health, because uh, there is already some research saying that uh, those communities that have where languages, indigenous language, native languages are alive and used, uh, so the, the healthier communities, uh, in many senses, put in uh, lower rates of suicides and uh, many other factors. Uh, so uh, at, at the Common Forum last year, we discussed that uh, actually indigenous languages should be determinants of health and uh, actually inspired by this conversation, this upcoming sessions, main topic is uh, related to health. Uh, it's territorial, planetary health, but also human health. Uh, is included there, and including this linguistic aspects of, of, of government. Um, if we take another right, like the right to uh, participate in decision making, there is also, there can be a lot of examples how this right couldn't be implemented without uh, languages. For example, when um, uh, indigenous peoples negotiate with uh, private companies uh, on certain industrial projects, so the companies come to their areas and they have to obtain, according to the same declaration, they have to obtain their free prior and informed consent by indigenous peoples. Uh, but this informed element is only uh, good if, if uh, the communities are fully informed and put in their own languages. Because there are still many communities that do not understand the dominant languages. And even if, even if they do, uh, not all of the difficult technical, technical aspects of each project uh, could be explained in a, in a, in a dominant language. Uh, it should be translated also to, to those communities' languages so they, they understand fully and they can sell their, all the members. Uh, so this, this is one uh, particular example, but there are many, many other uh, examples of different uh, interlinkages. And needless to say about the fact that, uh, as Diego mentioned, that Language is a core element of our identity, and therefore it's a core element of the right to self-determination, which is, I think, the cornerstone of all uh, of everything that is needed in the declaration. Okay, I'm gonna take a little bit of the moderator's prerogatives and uh, turn it over to uh, our commentator, Kristen Carpenter, who is also going to have make observations about the commentaries today from our speakers, but may also respond to these little dot, red dots in the Q&A function of our, of our Zoom program today. So Kristen, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Matthew, and greetings to Diego and Alexei and everybody who's in the room. I'm sorry, I couldn't be with you in person. Matthew, is the sound okay? Good. Go ahead. Okay, it's <clears throat> echoing back here, but I'll just ignore it. Um, and I should say, Osio Nagad, during um, the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, I'm studying the Cherokee language, and like Diego, I'm committed by the end of ten years to be able to speak it at least better than I than I do now. Um, and fortunately, we have a lot of materials that um, make that possible to study uh, the Cherokee language um, online and in person in the U.S. But um, I thought I'd pick up on the current conversation about significance of thinking about language as a human right before talking maybe about the US context in particular. And I noticed um, in the Q&A that Karima Benun from the Michigan faculty 
um, and a former special rapporteur on cultural rights had asked um, us to um, amplify what it means for um, language to be a human right. And Matthew's absolutely right that it, we don't really have that discourse in the US. And so working on American Indian law and American Indian language rights, I think there is a lot to learn from this international movement, some of which Diego and Alexia have already mentioned. For me, one really key point is the idea that human rights are inherent in all of us just as human beings. And every single person by virtue of being a living person um, is entitled to certain things that make their lives livable and um, help them enjoy the basic dignities of life on this earth. And there are things like the right to life, the right to religion, the right to culture, um, the right to family. And included in that is the right to language, at least according to various international instruments. And it isn't just the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, the right to language is thought to be a universal right. It goes back to uh, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And I think that it has to do with um, the idea that to be able to speak, to express yourself, to have ideas, to exist as a human being that interacts with the world um, requires one to be able to use their mother tongue, to talk in the way that their relatives and ancestors and the, the people who um, help them become a human um, speak or would have spoken if um, their languages hadn't been taken away. And we often talk about the, um, Alexi used the interlinkages of human rights or the indivisibility of human rights. And the idea that the right to speak one's language is key to one's health or to one's religion or cultural identity is so borne out in US experience, but we often, as you said, Matthew, don't think about it in that way. Um, just a few examples, I, I do a lot of work with Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, and they learned during the pandemic that a lot of their fluent speakers weren't receiving health care, not only because, you know, they didn't have the transportation or the money um, to get to health care clinics, but also because their first language was Cherokee, and they couldn't really communicate with caregivers in a way that would fully address their health situation or help them understand the treatment plan. And so Cherokee Nation started assigning translators to travel with fluent speakers to health clinics. And that's you know a, a tangible example of the observation that one can't enjoy the right to health without the right to language. Another example you know, from our very own legal field has to do with um, the right to counsel and the right to have legal charges explained to you in the language that you understand. Um, at the border between the US and Mexico, many, many, if not most of the people being detained are indigenous people from Guatemala, Honduras, um, Venezuela, and so on. And if they receive interpretation services, they receive them in Spanish, not in a language like Quechua or um, another language that they understand. And there are dozens of stories Alexia and I wrote about at least one of them in an, an article we wrote together where um, people, parents and children provided translation services in Spanish have not been able to explain um, their health or their social or their economic circumstance. Children have actually died in custody because their parents signed off on immigration forms that didn't represent their actual situation. Um, so the right to language is part and parcel of the right to legal counsel or the right to um, a defense if we're talking about the courts. Um, so I think this all kind of ties to the idea that um, speaking one's language is part of what it means to be human. When governments like our United States deny people the right to speak their language, they are denying some of what it means to be human as an individual and as a collective. People have talked about cultural identity. Some of the tribes we work with, Shawnee tribe, says they can't conduct their ceremonies in any language other than Shawnee. So if they can't speak Shawnee, they cannot practice their religion. 
Um, if there's a right we believe in in the United States, I think the free exercise of religion is really one of them. Um, maybe that's as close to a human right as something that we um, understand and believe in. And then I'll just say, and then Matthew, I'll pause also about human rights. Um, the human rights system understands that states have obligations both to remedy past harms and to ensure rights in an ongoing sense. And this whole idea of remedies is something we struggle with a lot in the United States. Um, and we need to figure it out. For example, we all know at this point that the boarding schools, the federal government's placement of indigenous children in boarding schools was specifically designed to eradicate their language and culture. Um, we know that to be true. The federal government is starting to admit it. That means the federal government has an obligation to remedy those past harms um, and to ensure um, ongoing rights to language. We have a really long way to go um, in figuring out the remedial component in the US, but I think that human rights framework gives us um, an important way to think about it in solidarity with brothers and sisters around the world who are, you know, can teach us a lot um, as far as indigenous peoples go uh, in the US about modes of advocacy and hopefully we can all support each other. Um, this is probably getting too long-winded, so I'll pause for a second. Thank you. You didn't have to pause. But I appreciate your comments, all of you. Um, I, I guess so I'll add one more thing before we get going. Um, you know, sitting here listening to you talk about languages reminds me of um, some things we're starting to learn here in Michigan about our own language and how it can impact us in terms of our uh, culture and, and also in the law. So last week we had a, an elder and a tribal judge from Michigan named Mike Kotoski who frequently tells a story about uh, the language, the word in Anishinaabe win for a child is Benoji, which um, is translated loosely into um, a spirit coming forth. So uh, we often compare that uh, when we talk together and we talk in court, we talk in our scholarship about how you, we learn in law school fairly early on that children in the common law are considered property. And you can actually see that when you look at the history of boarding schools, what uh, in the United States, especially here in Michigan, how children were actually treated by literal pieces of property. They were used as assets to generate revenue to keep the school going, which was a, a machine of doom and destruction. And I wanna recognize that Winona Single here is here today from Michigan State. She's my partner and she's a member of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. And she is really the leading scholar on boarding schools in the state of Michigan, at least right now. And um, so I learned all of these things from her. But um, are there, uh, I wanna open it up to the opportunity for questions. I know we have some on the, on the Zoom, but are, is anybody in the, in the room who has a question that they would like to ask? You're certainly invited to do so at this time. You know, also don't have to. Um, is it possible to take a look at some of the questions on Zoom? I can't really see them. I guess I can go. I think um, both Kristen and I have access to them. So if you want, I can read them and you can all respond. Um, go ahead. Why don't you okay. go ahead? All right. So um, first uh, question we have is from uh, actually Professor Rebecca Benjamin. Um, she says, thank you for this important event. Uh, can you please explain how you understand the relationship of language rights and other human rights to indigenous peoples and others? I know that language rights have a significant impact on cultural rights, the right to freedom of assembly, freedom of religion or belief, freedom of expression, the right to self-determination, economic rights, the right to education, minority rights, children, children's rights, um, et cetera. Uh, however, I would be pleased to hear more about how um, the experts on the panel view these interrelationships with other human rights, uh, so as to help us have a holistic understanding of the importance. So. I'll turn it over to our speakers. Did you get the question? Well, I think that more of the, the answer already came from, from Christine. Uh, what I will just let I like. Is what actually she professor already expressed now. For me, for my view, it's also holistic, it's intersection. Because through the language, you can uh, 
reinforce or uh, um, you can enjoy the other. So for indigenous people, as I mentioned, it's not a method of communication. It's important for all the other ways that was mentioned in the book. You know, right of the children, they need to have the right to, to, to learn their own language in the education. So they have the right education. I mean, I think it's <coughs> intersectional. Uh, uh, so that is the only thing that I can think of. It's a central part, as I mentioned, and I believe, and as I said before, our, for our survival. For this. Uh, yeah, the question on uh, spoken already a bit on, on the different the linkages. Um, and sometimes um, difficult for us to imagine what what other what the linkages could be <laughs> last year then the conference um, languages in the um, Republic of Kaspia in uh, southern Siberia, Russia. And um, there was a speaker uh, from the university uh, who said like those uh, the, the for, former students, so where they where they work actually uh, after graduation, and um, so she listed like many different specialities and professions. And, uh, among them was uh, also police, security services, and uh, well, why <laughs> some linguists go to police, for example, um, and um, so she said, well. They found out that um, so those policemen who actually understand the language and culture uh, of indigenous people, so they would better um, investigate the crime committed by uh, these indigenous representatives. Uh, so they <coughs> use those uh, language skills and the knowledge of culture uh, for this purpose too. <laughs> I mean, I. I didn't mean to um, mention this example that's uh, more significant, uh, of course not, but um, just another illustration of uh, you know, how everything is interconnected. And um, of course, uh, for, the, for the education in the Russian uh, National Action Plan has three dimensions. Um, it's one is culture, another is uh, digitization, and uh, the third one is education. And <coughs> I think um, in in Karelia, in the Republic of Karelia, there was a, a, a study, uh, a, a recent study on um, of the by the Karelian Research Center, linguistic institute. There. So they uh, like interviewed many parents. Of indigenous indigenous parents, uh, and um, where kids don't speak the language, the native language, and so they ask whether the parents want the kids to learn the language or not. And most of the parents said yes. Yeah, we definitely couldn't teach in the family, but uh, we would like uh, the kids to know the language. And so they they uh, another question was where do you think uh, kids could learn the language, so most of the parents rely on the education system, even though it's understand, it's understood also that the education system isn't capable alone to, uh, to teach the language in a sustainable way, so then the students would just, you know, use the language in real life after this kind of, after two lessons a week or one lesson a week uh, during certain grades. Uh, but, um, Somehow in the Russian society, it's very rooted uh, that um, the education system is something that can save the languages, even in war. So, uh, and that's why I think uh, it's important uh, for the, um, you know, to consider this interlinkage between language, right, and 
right to education, um, because sometimes it is even used against the language, the, the, the language learning. Uh, in some states, in some societies, uh, they they just say that um, the, the federal government could say, well, we we don't. Um, so, uh, like for example, the kids should not learn the language in the kindergarten because uh, the school system is not ready uh, to use that language as a medium medium of instruction. And then, the, if there is no uh, kind of uh, consistency between the different levels of the education system in terms of the language learning, so then uh, there is no need to even try <laughs> so it's like, uh, perception like that, unfortunately. So we should consider uh, this is the linkage uh, and provide the opportunity uh, for, for the children not only to learn the language as a subject, uh, but also to receive the whole education in indigenous languages if possible. And uh, if not possible, then we should organize conditions uh, so it would be possible in the future. I understand there's a question from somebody in HSC, Do you mind asking one? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, has there been a study of intellectual law and copyright law studies were written regarding use and, and distribution and commodifications of our languages? Um, all of the products of our languages are derived from native language and are no less inseparable, inseparable from us and our land or our spiritual purposes. And then a bit of elaboration on that. Um, I mean, should an indigenous, uh, indigenous people not have the right of self-determination regarding an outside entity commodifying the language for profit in books, movies, and to which research? Uh, hence, the product of our languages written and spoken are products of intellect and are our intellectual property. Um, should we each not have a right to determine whether and how our languages are commodified by those outside languages? Did you get the question? Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. Somehow. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Uh, this is something that I was. Um, at least from my view, uh, I try to recommend and try to push uh, in all the spaces that I can, that I can interact or I can work. Is that uh, nowadays uh, I believe that uh, indigenous peoples must occupy the spaces of power that allow us to decide what we what is important to us, or in which way we want to learn, we want to implement, we want to apply. I, I, I somehow I understood that part because from the external part, probably they would like to no. I believe that probably, yeah, in the past, I understood that there was uh, movements from non-indigenous that were helping us a lot. And I recognize that of course, there were people that were not helping, but there were also people that were helping indigenous people. They worry about these people. And they try to, to do things uh, in their view that will help us. But nowadays, I believe that we can do it by ourselves. And for example, they are um, the spaces at the UN, for example, Berman, or Emory, a special rapport. I just want to have, I, I come to see just indigenous people. You know, in the past, they were not indigenous people, part of this. Uh, but probably because we didn't have, you know, the education, the appropriate education uh, from Latin America, one of the main challenges to us is English, for example, the way we communicate internationally with other ones. But I'm taking, I'm capturing this attention because I think it's related. We can do, we can say what is good to us. So one of the things actually what we were pushing 
for the international year of international decade with that. I mean, the UNESCO is the global agency that lead the process, but they have to include indigenous experts that they are one to say, no, this is not the way that you don't have to implement this uh, because your international organization really that is better to no, we are. So for example, I saw in the last uh, meetings that in which people say we don't want to have events, you know, for example, more of the the concentration uh, of the actions during the international year works. I think it was necessary to call that to draw that you know, the importance of the, the to do things for the revitalization of the people. But the indigenous people now are saying, we don't want to have more events. Now we want to have practical actions. Who are saying that indigenous people? Who are going to lead that indigenous <laughs> Now we have indigenous people that uh, have this profession as linguistic or anything else that we can contribute somehow. So we are the ones. And that is my personal. And uh, I hope that with the time, uh, it's important to empower us more, to have more the capacity, the capabilities to contribute to our own uh, ways uh, of what we wanted to, to achieve as a community. I hope <laughs> I can answer that. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a lawyer question for sure. Alex, did you want to say anything? I know Kristen was I think Kristen in a better position <laughs> as a lawyer, but also as somebody who knows a lot about the property rights. Um, I, I believe, um, uh, of course, uh, in, in terms of what Diego said, uh, has said that um, in, well, I think it's also. Uh, in even the Durham Forum and many other uh, expert bodies um, have explained that the main uh, responsibility to, to you know, for safeguarding of indigenous languages is with the indigenous people themselves, because they are the bearers of the uh, of the right to these languages and of the responsibility to you know keep them alive. Uh, but also as we talk about the knowledge that is contained in the languages, uh, very important knowledge, um, additional knowledge um, that indigenous peoples come into climate change negotiations, they say that we have the keys uh, for the resolution of this crisis. We, we have all the knowledge that is all in, also in the language. Um, so it is probably mm, would be selfish for indigenous peoples to just say, well, this is only for us. This is not for you. And since indigenous peoples are coming to negotiate uh, with all other peoples uh, about these crises, so I think they are um, generous in terms of offering what they have. So this indigenous languages is, uh, and in the entire linguistic diversity is, uh, uh, for the say uh, is um, basically uh, not the, just the property of its peoples, but also uh, um, a heritage of the whole uh, planet, of the entire humanity, I think. And that's why it's the, not only the responsibility of indigenous people, but also the responsibility of, of the humanity to help safeguard these languages because if other peoples want to use the knowledge they should contribute and help uh, indigenous peoples to you know to make them to, you know, to keep them alive the language is known absolutely Kristen. um thanks um i really appreciate what diego and alexia said about um I think indigenous leadership on indigenous languages, which is kind of at the heart of this question, and also the tension perhaps between indigenous peoples, sometimes desire to keep those languages 
private or in the community and the needs or at least claims of the world community to access some of the information in the languages because that can really be a tension, especially for indigenous languages that have been so um, vulnerable over time. And I think um, one common and maybe a frustrating experience for tribes in the US is that on the one hand, non-Indians spent so long trying to destroy these languages and now somehow with culture shifts, um, non-Indians are interested in learning the languages or appropriating them in different ways. Um, and it's, I mean, at best an irony, but the um, intellectual property answers to the questions are, I guess, as follows. You cannot copyright a language itself. Um, copyright is limited to the expression of an original idea in a tangible medium. That's my property law professor spiel. And so when Dr. Baird asked about um, copywriting materials that have been published, those are copyrightable. And um, so for example, if a tribe publishes a dictionary or a linguist publishes a dictionary, um, if there's an original aspect of that, and it's not just sort of an alphabetical listing of the words, um, but there's something original, then the author, that is the person who put those ideas down on paper can copyright them either as a matter of common law or statutory law. The tricky thing that the question alludes to is that often it hasn't been the indigenous speakers or teachers or linguists who have secured the copyright, but a non-indigenous expert who came into the community or even the publisher themselves who then applies for the copyright and then tribes are in this horrible position of having to ask some non-Indian linguist or publisher for permission to use their own language materials. And that is you know, nothing short of um, infuriating. When I, and a lot of the tribes we're working with are, are really interested in these questions. And I think they can be handled twofold. The best is on the front end. And so if a tribe is working with um, an expert or a publisher or writer, um, that question of who holds the copyright to the published material is something that needs to be negotiated right from the beginning. And if the tribe wants to hold the copyright itself, that's absolutely a negotiating item, um, but it has to put that in writing and get the publisher or whoever it is to agree to that. Um, if if there's already something that's been published and the tribe doesn't hold copyright, then it's it's a stickier situation. But um, some tribes, because of the historical injustices and, and inequities have worked with the estates of authors or publishers to reclaim some of those rights to publish material in their own languages, um, again, through negotiation. Um, it's a, a longer story than we can probably get fully into here but there are also protections available under a trademark for different tribal names and insignia. And one tribal linguist I know of even has a patent on his um, language teaching methodology because it was eligible as a novel invention. So it couldn't be appropriated by somebody else. Um, so yes, there are legal protections, um, but they, they need to be negotiated carefully and, and probably with a lawyer. Can I ask one, one question? I, mean, I know we only have two minutes left before, and I appreciate everybody staying. But can I just ask uh, the two of you, or okay, briefly, just a, a quick question, which is how do you, how, what similarities do you see between your challenges in preserving indigenous languages and the challenges of non indigenous groups to, to preserve uh, uh, regional and minority languages? Frisian and Romansh and all these other languages that are dying. No, I don't want to use that term, right? But that are spoken less and less. Uh, do you see them as allies or are you working from a different perspective than those groups who are trying to preserve their languages? Well, uh, I may, uh, this is the one of the, uh, difficulties of understanding at the UN level, for example, that's why there is a special rapporteur on indigenous people and there is 
special rapporteur on minority rights. From my view, uh, the, there are similarities in the troubles and in the uh, challenge that we have. Uh, what was one of the main, the main aspects that can be recognized the letter S at the end of the indigenous people, it was also respect of the minorities. Because with the indigenous peoples, the international community, are, they are recognizing the collective rights that doesn't have the minority. I mean, that they are not recognizing, for example, but for the indigenous people, they are recognizing the, the, the collective rights. But the struggles are similar. Uh, that struggle that, uh, I mean, probably the concept of uh, how we identify, for example, Afro descendants is a new uh, uh, struggle that they are also having at the UN level. And what they are looking for the next steps, they are looking of what have been achieved by the They just established a permanent forum. They also want an educational rapporteur. They are, the, I mean, the, the Probably we, some of us suffer more or less, but at the end, I, be, I see similar. And I believe that we can exchange the experience and how we overcome in different areas. But the uh, problem is how they are uh, somehow organized at the yeah. thinking in the multilateral level. If we go to a national level, it's another scenario. But Thinking in a multilateral level, I see this, the, the scenarios around the industry. That's, if I may, um, I agree uh, in your work. Just to add that, uh, I remember that the first meeting uh, at UNESCO when um, the national year was proclaimed, and UNESCO gathered the meeting to decide on the next steps and so on. And then UNESCO suddenly proposed, would we, uh, would we uh, Good idea to maybe invite the minority language representatives uh, to our group, so we can, so they can also enjoy from this movement. Um, and um, and they didn't only propose; they already invited those people who were in the room. Uh, many of them from those, uh, you, know, you know, Danish minority in Germany, for example, Germany minority Denmark, and this many other uh, European minorities and indigenous peoples. We are not against that because, understandably, this this is very similar challenges uh, that these languages face. Uh, but indigenous peoples uh, were protective of themselves um, because um, they they understand that if all these people would be invited at some point, they would take over the decision making, uh, and UNESCO would use this to put forward the own agenda. And we all know how difficult UNESCO is in terms of being based in France. Uh, state has problems with collective rights in general. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very difficult, difficult and very uh, sensitive issue for indigenous people. So they, they said it very strongly that, no, we, uh, we are not against, but please do not change the agenda. We are here to speak about indigenous people's languages, uh, even though it's not the title indigenous languages, just not indigenous people's languages, but this is what we mean. Uh, but then also at the same meeting, there was a decision made that uh, we would open uh, indigenous people's are okay to open the door uh, for minority languages. And also keeping in mind that there are still states the world that they not recognize indigenous peoples, but instead they recognize national minorities. But we all know that those national minorities could be indigenous people. So in many places they actually are. Uh, and um, I will not name any state, but um, one of the first meetings under the National Year of Indigenous Languages was held in, in the city of Changsha in uh, China. And China was very, very generous, very open. They said, uh, we it also to support the national year. And they actually supported, and they said, we would use this opportunity to support our national minority languages mm -hmm. in China. So that's that's okay. I think uh, that was very useful decision to, to be very um, 
inclusive individual in terms of um, minorities. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Kristen, um, we're about wrapping up. I'll give you the last word. Well, just on that point, um, it's so interesting in the US because a lot of the current monolingual advocacy, um, English only advocacy, I think is anti-immigrant in spirit. It comes from a desire for homogeneity in society and in some states. Um, and it's you know often an attack on Spanish speaking people or um, speakers of Asian languages, for example. But the um, ramifications may be quite similar and the um, opportunities for solidarity, I think are often, are also um, something we should think about. Um, either Diego or Alexi mentioned earlier, the idea of plurilingualism. And when I'm at the UN, I'm always amazed that people from all over the world can get together for two weeks negotiate documents, talk about really difficult issues. We do it through interpreters. In the US, we rarely do that. You know, we expect everybody to speak English. We don't see necessarily the upsides of a plurilingual world, but both through immigrant, minority and indigenous languages, I guess that's through all three of those, um, we could think about the richness, the diversity, the empowerment that would come if we as a society, and the U.S. should really lead the, the world on that, given the diversity of our country, what if we could all speak in our own languages and really bring to bear um, the kind of understanding that um, we have in those languages to enrich the conversation, um, the profession of interpretation is, is vital. Uh, Matthew, you and I have both worked on issues of interpretation when it comes to legal documents. We know that these are really important aspects of American Indian law, indigenous people's law. So I guess my, my own hope um, for the decade is that maybe one change in terms of society, the hearts and minds aspect of this um, in the U.S. might be that we could start to imagine and embrace a plurilingual world in which not only indigenous people, but all people get to speak their own languages. Um, and that would be perceived as a good, you know, not a, a negative um, or divisive aspect of American society. And I guess I'll just say, since I have the floor, um, thank you to the University of Michigan, to Matthew, to Winona, um, for hosting this event. I think it is so important for us doing American Indian rights in the US to interact with the international leaders. Um, you all are so lucky to have Diego and Alexei in the room. I've learned so much from them. They were both at the forefront of the international year and decade. Um, and I hope that you all have a chance to um, talk after the panel and um, continue this important conversation. So thanks for letting me join. Thank you so much, everyone.